All right, and I'll just introduce myself quickly. I'm uh, Michael Morton. I'm the director of the Keystone Extended Care Unit in Chester, Pennsylvania. And I've been around the block in this field. I used to work for Dr. Carnes. He hired me in 95 to run the unit. And I came on board and did work there. And then I left and did other things with clergy and religious and National uh, Institute for Training and Education. And over the years, I guess cumulatively, I have about 40 years in human services from live in house parent to therapist to director to et cetera, et cetera, with, with various and sundry populations of people. And I think, like most of us in this field, as well as being a parent and being a teacher and educator in Philadelphia for six years at the secondary level, is why don't people change? Or why don't people get it? Or how is it that? with all these efforts and good work and all of our efforts to kind of help people be different, they don't always get it. We know in alcoholics, uh, maybe 50% is the perceived rate of recovery for those who actually engage in the process. Um, that's not great. When on an average year, the household survey suggests 22 million people self-identify as substance abusers and users less than a few hundred thousand acknowledge that they have a problem and fewer than that get help and fewer than that get the help that they need. So it's, it's a, a dim prospect in many ways. And I think with sexual addiction, um, certainly not anything new. Um, it's, it's ancient and has been problematic since the beginning of time, caused the Trojan War. Um, I, I think we have lots of issues that we think are new, they're not, they're old. And the issue of how people change, why they don't change, shame, goes back to Genesis and so on. It's, there's really nothing new under the sun. The, the next slide is new, and this is from Kavod. And um, what I found at Keystone, which is a very intensive residential program that Carnes put together as aftercare in the beginning, after 42 days of primary care. And of course, that, that group of people that were ready, willing, and able to pay the bill for that has diminished, I guess. And even those who can afford it can't seem to give up the time to do it. One might at face value believe that that's a choice. I don't know that it is. Some are ready and willing, and if you know a little bit of the motivational interviewing stuff, there's some intrinsic aspects of this, of the person's internal efficacy and self-capacities to actually believe that they can do what they're going to do. And <clears throat> at, at Keystone, we kind of try to get through heavily emphasizing these green boxes, trying to break through the denial, understand addictive disease and illness, the sexual addiction component of it, surrendering to the process, limiting the damages, trying to establish sobriety in the time that they're there. Usually between 30 days to 42 days used to be 90 days. 90 days was the silver bullet from the National Institute of Drug Abuse that suggested by the research of Tom McClellan and others at Penn that it took the brain about that much time to really let go and kind of reformat. So in that process, they're in an intensive communal experience where they're interfacing with each other and staff constantly in a very intense manner from early in the morning to late at night. And that's a participation in a culture of support that most of the men, and it's mostly men that come to us, have never experienced in their lives. And it forces them into relational conflicts as well as engagements and presence. They can't hide. A, a person can go to SA, SAA, they can go to AA, GA, and they can keep their mouth shut, sit on their thumbs and go home. And they can isolate 50 years like that. In Keystone, there's, no, there's nowhere to get away. But what I have found there in my first run through about 95, 96, to back again seven years, is that it provides an amazing environment to practice therapy and use different modalities in what is a safe, secure, supervised setting. And when you're dealing with addiction and trauma, that becomes an immensely important prospect. In my outpatient work in Philadelphia, I have the person for maybe an hour, a little longer if I stretch it, and then they leave. 
and they go back to whatever that they're going back to, whether it's hostile or lonely or maybe even addictive. So that's, that's a complicated process. I also realized these boxes, which again, Kavod put together, and I, I have a big one hanging in the living room. And also we have some smaller ones that are in the family room and in the main office where the staff sit. So when I'm working with people, I'm constantly pointing, whether it's in the group sessions or whether it's a couple sessions or an individual session, I'm pointing to the boxes. And I'm talking about the different aspects of their lives. And so in the initial stages, they do a very thorough history. They do some first step work. And within, within three to five days, they tell their story. And they do that to the whole group and community. And that's beginning to establish for them a certain sense of security and grounding and safety. They're meeting with their, you know, their group members on a regular basis their therapist, their family therapist, their first step counselor, and so on. And that, <clears throat> that's very important for them being willing, even when they're not able, to surrender to a process. This is kind of a little summary that I put together, because I realize the limitations of time for us. You don't, I mean, I'm not going to teach you EMDR and or detour method in 90 minutes or less. Let's get real. I just spent two days with uh, AJ Popke, who actually gave me permission to hand out his work. I like him a lot, he's a very interesting fellow. Um, is that, what's going on with that? It'll just keep going. It'll just go away? So anyway, what, what is believed to be the process is that there's a neurological balance in a distinct physiological system that allows information to be processed to an adaptive resolution. I want you to think about, most of us are old enough to remember floppy disks and maybe even five inch discs and and I remember 10 inch discs and when you put them in they were either Apple or PC and from the original state they were programmed to speak a very specific language and that was their limitation and when you try to put an Apple product into a Tandy computer or a PC it didn't work they couldn't speak to one another and then I also want you to think about Wi-Fi and the internet and all of the different viruses and spyware and worm drives and all of the different things. If you have a Microsoft and you open it up without protection, what happens is it gets invaded. And I kind of think of the human being, the human organism, as a similar type of uh, organism in relationship to other organisms that's symbiotically connected and is constantly from conception on downloading different files and file drives that are teaching him or her how to be in this world relationally before they ever think a thought. Their body thinks, their systems think, and their pre-verbal memory is very powerful. One of the EMDR people who does a lot of training and one of the pioneers does this workshop called Before There Were Words. And if you look at Rob Anda's stuff in Filetti's from the ACE study and you see the neurological development and the trees and the way that the trees grow in a healthy child versus an unhealthy situation, it's astounding. That which gets nurtured is that which develops. So if it's fight, flight, or freeze, even in the infant, even in inner uterine development, it's systemically being processed and conditioned and formatted. So that's powerful stuff to think about and then think about the cases, or at least the case histories that we deal with all the time <clears throat> in terms of uh, abuse, violence, neglect, etc., even before birth. So by adaptive resolution, the connections to appropriate associations are made and the experience is used constructively by the individual and is integrated into a positive emotional and cognitive schema. So those schemas are like those file drives that create those patterns in the way that the individual perceives both themselves, other, and the universe at large. Essentially, what is useful is learned and stored with the appropriate effect and available for future use. So if in my house, when I went in, I went like this because I didn't know if the old man was going to whack me across the head, that becomes useful, doesn't it? Self-effacing, being told that I'll die and go to hell if I masturbate, 
that women are sacred images and are not to be violated. Pornography is okay, but don't you dare touch somebody. Um, those adaptive resolutions become behaviors that are patterns in a human being's life. And they, be, they begin to develop pathways and rewards as well as consequences. But it is an adaptation to life, as George Valiant, who did much of the longitudinal studies of alcoholic men over the years at Harvard, and he talked about adaptation to life, that it's, it's not sick stuff. It's an attempt for a human being, a human organism, to adapt to the stressors and experiences that they happen to inherit. How many remember bomb shelters? Do you remember getting, like, the alarm would go off and Sister Ann Ursula would have us hiding under the desks at 3 p.m. in Oak Lane? That's freaking crazy. We did that. As if there were going to be anything left of us. We went under a desk in a glass-ridden <laughs> cinder block classroom. All right, so we, I recognize, how many of you know that sign on the, on the, uh, the bomb shelter, right? <coughs> Yellow with the arrows. I don't know what that means, like the bomb's going to come out and like, but that's, so you climb down there and there's still people I know in some parts, I won't mention in the States, who still have them. So in some ways too, the EMDR stuff, it's not new. This is ancient stuff. It's not new. And it matches a lot of classical understanding and theory in terms of human behavior and, and the, the mind of human beings. With severe trauma, and I, I think, I just think even after all these years of doing all the work that I've done, both in prisons and you name it, across the board, <clears throat> I still have a hard time grappling with the impact and the long-term consequences of trauma and cumulative trauma. Teaching in the inner city or in the suburbs, in the, in the suburbs, yesterday where my daughter is a senior, there was a fight amongst four girls, eight teachers ended up in the hospital, four had concussions. These are juniors and seniors in high school in a very affluent community where allegedly they can think, write, walk, and talk. I was astounded. I mean, I went to schools where you had to watch your back and that never happened. So things are not well. She's taking her AP exam, so I texted her and told her I was thinking about her and I hope she could still focus. Can you imagine four of your teachers being taken out of the school because they were assaulted when they tried to break up a fight? That's frightening. Anyway, what it, what it does, or appears to do, is create an imbalance that occurs in the nervous system. May, not everybody experiences the same thing. Caused perhaps by neurotransmitters, adrenaline. Due to the imbalance, the system is unable to function optimally and the information acquired at the time of the event, including images, sounds, affects, etc., gets locked in and stored. I think of it as being quarantined in the brain, in its disturbed state. Therefore, the original material which is held in this distressing, excitatory, state-specific form can be triggered by a bunch of different things in the form of nightmares, flashbacks, and intrusive thoughts, the so-called positive symptoms of PTSD. So far, are we still awake and all? Try not to beat your slide of usually too much before we do a little of this. So how it's thought to work. The hypothesis is that the, the procedural elements, including the dual attention, trigger a physiological state that facilitates information processing. So what it is or why it is or how it is, there's still research and they're looking at PET scans and uh, MRIs and different things, but something happens. I also believe in this process, if I come up to you and look at you, according to Siegel and all the other people, there's mirror neurons, there's something that happens between us, right? So if I'm this close to you, what do you think? <laughs> and I start doing this and I'm, I'm looking at you. I'm looking in your eyes, I'm watching and then I'm asking you to do this. For most of us, that's a relatively unique experience, I think. I think. I mean, I, not anybody ever did it to me, except Sister Ann Ursula. But <laughs> she, was, she was going this way. Not, not, although, maybe that way, too. Don't her, her by that. <clears throat> so there's various mechanisms, then, by which this activation and facilitation has been proposed. And that's 
That's the part of this that I think is interesting. Deconditioning, and these are theoretical ideas, these are thoughts that people have, caused by a relaxation response. What happens when I've put someone into a position where they're relaxed, and I ask them, Jim Knight does a lot of nice things with this, in the back of the head and in the front, and safety, he's a really wonderful teacher too, if you ever got a chance to go to one of his workshops. And the question that we always ask, and the, the, the paramount question of what makes a good therapist, especially in doing trauma work or EMDR, is, is the person feeling safe? Do, do they feel okay with this process? And, and what a sex addict, at least who comes to Keystone does, is he tries, even in his desperation, to control. He's not letting go. And sometimes pushing the envelope a little too much just drives him deeper into that hole, that he's gonna let go even less. So it's a funny thing in addictions treatment. Henry Tybow is one of the founding psychiatrists of AA. Back in the 30s, he said one of, one of the most confounding parts of addictions treatment is getting the person to accept treatment. They don't want it, or they can't accept it, because that means they have to give up. Perhaps a pattern or an adaptive mechanism that has been working actively in them since they were born. Perhaps since they were in their mother's womb. Think about that, get depressed. Anyway, <laughs> a shift in the brain state, enhancing activation and strengthening of weak associations. Now, EMDR and the detour method is highly directive. Popke never shuts up during the whole thing. He's very interesting, um, but he knows what he's doing. And he has a good intuitive sense. And the other is, you want to that seat? The other aspect of that is that he's paying attention. He has uh, in body work what, what people might call an attunement with the individual that he's trying to help. So he's, he's present and he's listening and he's paying attention and he's asking and checking in with them the whole time. And then, so there's different parts to this. Other factor involved in the client's dual focus of attention as he simultaneously attends to the present stimuli and past trauma. Where do most of us live? Yeah. Right now, what are you thinking about? It's 20 after? Dinner? <laughs> <laughs> or are you tired? How many have been here since early morning or East Coast time? I can't read anymore. It's after, like I can't see anything I'm looking at. So anyway, be patient. Therefore, when we ask the client to bring up the memory of the trauma, we may be establishing a link between consciousness and the site where the information is stored in the brain. I'll do this quickly and then... I also want you to start thinking. We'll do something, maybe a little group exercises, and then if anyone in here, and it's probably not the case, if anyone in here has an issue, <laughs> don't ask my wife or kids, um, the issue has to be on a, on a scale of one to 10, like a, a one or two. I don't want any of you buddy decompensating or anything like that. It might be your issues with chocolate, um, things like that. We, we can do a little demo. Um, it could be, I did it at the training with um, Popkey a couple weeks ago in Baltimore. I did it with my, especially my older daughters. When they call, my first thought is, what do they want? <laughs> Dad, are you selling your car? No, why, why do you ask? <laughs> they want a car. Oh, and by the way, do <laughs> you, you think you can help me with a computer? You're 37 years old, for Christ's sake, you know? Um, and, and so I did this detour process with one of my uh, colleagues in the class, and he installs a little something, a little physiological trick, if you will, and I found myself doing it all the time. And, and even at right now, if I do it, my shoulders go down, I feel a little more relaxed, my breathing deepens. And no, you can't have a computer. <laughs> it's, it's very, it's kind of, you know, it sounds trivial, but any of you with adult children or adolescent children know where the money goes. It's, it's not good. <laughs> so in the context of the other elements, the, the dual stimulation activates information systems. And, and in a way, you no, know, it's like if I say to you, Mike, and I want your last piece of chicken, right? I, I distract you and you forget about what you're doing in a minute. And, and these procedural elements in the MDR, I think, are very, very helpful in, in putting the person in a more 
available disposition to have things happen to them. So whether directly on the physiological system or engenders a state of mind necessary for assimilation or both is uncertain. So they don't, what I like about this process in Shapiro, like they don't claim to have the answer. They're, they're not absolutists. And if you ask AJ about something, he'll just look at you in his little marine cap and will say, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know why it happens, you know. Um, however, with each set of stimulation, we move the disturbing information at an accelerated rate further along the appropriate neurophysiological pathway until it is adaptively resolved. How many of you have watched kids play soccer? I've been doing it for 39 years. Very, uh, I'm not proud of that. Um, but anyway, I was, I was ready to retire last year when my 17 year old just turned 18. And one of the things that I noticed over and over again with children playing soccer is no matter how aggressive, defensive, good, slow, fast, clever their footwork, very few of them finish. A finisher is worth their weight in gold on the soccer field because they take the ball down and then they kick it in. They finish. And in our lives and in addictive processes and in addictions treatment, how many people even finish treatment? In American culture, how many people even finish a Z pack when they have? <laughs> they don't. Ask any doctor. My mother used to take us to a malt shop after we went to the dentist to get our fillings taken care of. And by Sundays, like she had rotten teeth, like really rotten teeth. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, what Shapiro says is that the information system is activated because abuse victims begin treatment with a negative self-concept in regard to the event and consistently end with a positive sense of self-worth. What's the hallmark in addictive disorders? When I was at Valley Forge Medical Center with heroin addiction back in the late 80s and early 90s, what was the big thing on the psychiatrist report? So-and-so has low self-esteem. And you were talking with people who had maybe 20, 30 years of failure, and they didn't have any idea why. They thought they were a piece of you-know-what, and they didn't have any understanding that there was another self or another possibility. And they didn't necessarily, even though the therapist might try to tell them, accept the fact that it was because they were raped or abused or you know molested as a child. They didn't get that, or they lived in hell every day and came back to it. That didn't matter. They were still doing this terrible thing. So it says, moreover, the opposite does not occur. That is, MDR provides an accelerated progression towards health, positive emotions, and higher self-regard but not towards dysfunction, inappropriate blame, and self-loathing. Now, this is a somewhat <clears throat> defendant statement in addictions, because what, what do most of us who have been around the block a few years in this field believe about treating trauma and perseverating issues other than the primary addictive disorder in the beginning? What do we believe will happen? They'll relapse. They'll implode, they'll uh, decompensate, and they'll go off to the races. Edna Foe at Penn suggests otherwise. I don't know if anyone has hard facts about how many people go off anyway. Natural relapse, probably just by going home. I don't know how many people have come to Keystone who have been through drug and alcohol treatment at primary care facilities and are sober many years. Some of them sober 25 years and they're still acting out sexually retired at 70 years old, coming in to do their work, their disclosure and their family work. And they've been sober at 12-step fellowships for 25, 30 years. So I think that speaks volumes. So the, the notion of activating the information processing system is central to this and has, has been a critical in the application of a variety of pathologies. Um, let's see. So real quickly, how many are familiar with EMDR? All right, can you spiel off the eight phases? <laughs> he laughs. All right, <clears throat> here, real quickly. History. Sound, sound familiar? Taking a client history, right? Identifying the targets from the positive and the negative events in the client's life. If you're doing the tasks and you, you work on them, and you've done the SDI, and you have those different graphs and the above average and below, and you have the readiness to change scales, and the emotions and close relationships and things. There's, there's a lot of telling information. To me, 
that the person does it and completes it, like I said, is, is a sign of engagement. And then that they're willing to talk about it. And I'm still fascinated by the fact that they will answer half those questions. And then by day three, they tell their story and they tell somebody some of the most dark things that they've ever done in their life within three days. And they'll come to me afterwards and say, Jesus Christ, I never told anybody that in my life. You know, I'm, I'm this big, handsome guy. He's very successful. He's cross-dressing and acting out uh, as, as the, uh, the masochist in these BD&M you know, relationships doing crack. It's crazy. And never told anybody. And you just kind of have this image. Oh, my God. You know, it's a horrible image. So you, you prepare them for processing and targets. You stabilize and increase access. Think about this. Stabilize and increase access to positive affects. How many of us do that? That's really important, isn't it? Yeah, that's part of the resourcing. Yeah, I usually, um, I usually try to give them some very specific. Like I always talk to them about breathing, being grounded. Um, I trained in, in mindfulness meditation. I went to Chiang Mai to a forest monastery, and I stayed there. And the little monk taught me, and it was probably the most significant thing I ever did. My son's an anthropologist and he brought me over and we went off to the monastery and it was really fabulous. That was like 15 years ago. And I, I try to teach that in every one, you know, instill that in every one of the guys, if they'll do it. And um, what's interesting about the mindfulness, it's like everything else. Uh, if you don't do it, it doesn't work. <laughs> and I, I found out that these directive modalities are very critical and Long, long time ago, Carl Whitaker, he said, the most important thing to realize as a therapist is you're not that important. <laughs> and the decentralization of the therapist is critical. And I'll have couples at the end of a session, an intensive two day, they'll say, what are we paying you for? Because they're like, they talked. I said, that's why, so you, you talked. <laughs> and <clears throat> in the, the exam for licensure, which I actually studied for in the past uh, years and years ago, one of, one of the main reasons for family therapy is to diffuse emotional reactivity between members. And in this addiction, more than any, being able to do that is highly significant. And that's some of these processes, is the attempt to diffuse the reactivity, not just within the person and the triggers, but in the relational context within which they live. At least in the old days, the idea with alcoholism and recovery, you had to be, and according to the ASAM criteria, the dimensional criteria for recovery and prognosis, you need a supportive environment. Carnes calls it a, a, a culture, a supportive culture, right, of embeddedment, really, where people can trust, hope, and, and believe in themselves again. Desensitization, and that is you process the experiences and triggers, which people bring up, and in, in doing that, um, it's, a, it's a hard choice sometimes to think about whether one's gonna jump into um, any specific process without doing their due diligence beforehand. And you might get a lot of different things, and so the issue, and I was gonna ask you to think about this, what, what is an issue in your life when you think about it that you have? It may fit the detour method, or it may be something much deeper, and sometimes in doing the desensitization of urge, the primary issues come up and one has to do the EMDR because it won't allow them to get past whatever it is they're currently doing. So think about your issue. Pretend we're in a delicatessen in Brooklyn and you're having a conversation with Woody Allen and you're gonna tell him what your issue is. Or what is your issue? I got an issue with that. What is your issue? What's your young <laughs> So the issue can be simple. I can't say no to my daughters. Or when somebody says this, I say that, or you know, I never get what I want. Or I don't feel that I'm this, or I'm, you know. So one of the things that these guys, and this is consistent with the men that I've worked with over the years, not that it applies to me or any of the other guys in here, fear of being found out. Fear of being inadequate or incompetent. Whoa. So, what does someone do or how do they function if they've grown up with that 
And this particular person was probably physically abused practically from his birth. His, um, his behavior was a nail fetish, which evolved into a rather elaborate process for him with big collections, and he was quite proud of his nails and so on. And I started out wanting to do the detour thing with him. He, he didn't seem to have a lot of other acting out behavior so much. But as we talked about the nails, all of this other stuff began to flood. And it was kind of like, what do I have left if I let go of the nails? I thought, well, you know, to me it didn't mean much, but to him, those nails were everything. His wife had cut her nails off a long time ago when she realized the nail fetish, and she was the first partner that ever said to me, I think he just wanted me for my nails. <laughs> um, <laughs> not making that up. <clears throat> so what were, the, what were the experiences that triggered him in current time? He had to tell the group about the nail fetish. This was a big burly man guy. And he's sitting with a bunch of strangers in group after three or four days telling his story and he has to tell them about that nail fetish. And then I said, the second, what's, what else triggered you recently? And he says, speaking with my wife about parenting and not being present. We have a 10 day blackout, but once, once they're off that, you know, all the court, all the stops are pulled and God knows what they're gonna engage in. But after that conversation, he was way, way withdrawn. And this was a person who was emotionally unavailable to begin with and had a rather rough childhood. He put down the severe punishments by his dad starting at two. Physical, harsh abuse and punishment. Frequent spankings threatened uh, to be left when they would go out. <clears throat> when he was 41, his brother um, sexually raped his daughter, who was a young child, and molested his, their son which they are still dealing with uh, all years later. So <clears throat> this guy had a lot of things and what, what the future template was, what, what the idea is, instead of just an avoidance of the nails, what are you gonna look forward to or be? The future template for him was to be able to, with confidence, assert himself without the need to be aggressive and calmly speak his truth. Sounds a little lofty and sophisticated, doesn't it? But what happens to someone who believes that they're inadequate, that they will be found out and they're incompetent? And the negative, the negative belief was, I'm not normal. So think about that. There's this guy, he's, he's got his bachelor's in math, he's a consultant, engineer, and all these different things. He's provided a good living and worked pretty hard. And <clears throat> what his positive belief was, not that I'm gonna win the lottery, be a millionaire, but that I have a good father and I can be resourceful. Some simple things. Do you think he believed that? Of course not. He didn't protect his kids from his brother, who was a madman when he took him to the parents, who had abused him. So he felt incredibly defective. And he remembered the one thing that happened to him as a child. And, and when I do this with the people that I work with, I, I pay attention and I watch their bodies go like this. And I watch the face change and the affect change. Sometimes the voice will change. And they're literally bringing up stuff. They're not reliving it, but they're allowing those quarantined files to be opened in a time when they're not being triggered by current events. And they're learning that they can hold that. And my job is to help facilitate that process that your head won't blow off, you know, your ass isn't going to fall off, nothing, like, you're, you're not going to relive this. And we get through it. That leads us to kind of the possibility of thinking about the nails. And so what we, what we did with him was we worked on the nails. And <clears throat> let me jump ahead a little bit. The installation is the positive counter networks that you want to do so that you're, and I know this language sounds corny, but think about the human brain. Think about things that you remember from being very young and how powerful the installation is. If I mention Santa Claus, what comes up? For other people, God. Um, 
Aunt Elizabeth. There's smells, there's taste, there's olfactory memories, there's all kinds of things that are re-engaged and constantly, constantly stored within us. So positive resources besides things that I can do, but also ways of thinking and connecting them with my bodily sensations and feelings are very, very important. Increased generalization effects with associated memories. And so the other thing is it's not a one-shot deal. You go back to it and then you do the body scan. And I think the body scan is really critical to ask people where they're feeling stuff. So the guy consistently relapsed, he still relapses, talks about when he was between two and four years old and his memory, what we did the EMDR on was his mother pushing him away from her saying, you're hurting me. And this guy is now 60 something. And he couldn't, he couldn't resolve that down to a zero with me. He just couldn't let go. And as he was doing it, he, he literally said, it, it hurts. This hurts. And, and so he could feel now, you know, 58 years later, what he experienced then. So the body, as Bessel van der Kolk does, you know, says, it keeps the score. It remembers. So you have that <coughs> somatic memory. Closure. <clears throat> um, how many in here... Does everyone here do outpatient work? So you have limited time frames, don't you? And if you have somebody that's a, a sort of difficult person, let's put it at that, in terms of being emotionally available and transparent, sometimes by the time you get them to even begin the process, the hour's up. I have become indulgent at Keystone because I can sit and do a four-hour session. <laughs> Alan Miller, the owner of Universal Health, doesn't know this. <laughs> but when a couple comes in, I mean, where else can you do that? And follow the protocol as it speaks. And then when they're done, I know they're going downstairs from the family room, and they're going to have dinner, and then they're going to go to a meeting, and they're going to have a good night group and go to bed. I know other clients, when they do this stuff, or they do it in trauma group, they leave the group and they drive into a bus. I know that that happens. Or they go act out. It's happened to me in the outpatient world. They act out. So the containment's really important and having closure. And what I think I find driven by a lot of times is the anxiety of the client who wants to get fixed fast. Mm -hmm. And somebody with complex PTSD does not get fixed fast. And I'm not that big a narcissist to believe that this is going to do it or anything else for that matter. And the idea of having safety, structure, and supervision is critical. But who are we working with? <coughs> Addicts. Addicts want what they want when they want it, and they want it now. And they want to be fixed now. And the more powerful they are in their lives and the more successful, the more they think they should be able to lick this. So that's, that's one of the things that even in EMDR, which is far more, in my opinion, cost efficient and time effective, still takes time. And then the reevaluation is critical. So when they come back, I always have, I use the, the papers that they use, the EMDR Institute, which I highly recommend to anybody, does a really beautiful process of training. And they have these little cheat sheets and I, I never adhere to anything in my life. <laughs> but this, every time a client comes in, I pull out the template, I fill it out, I have my notes, their positive, negative belief, the, the word, the safe word. So <clears throat> I make sure that I follow that. The next time they show up, I then ask them, so what's happened in the last week? Any dreams? Any this? Any reactivity? Et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And we go through it, and then I remind them that we're going to just check out in a very relaxed way what's their subjective level of you know discomfort or how are they feeling and what happened then and, and then we go back to it and I try to help them finish what they started and that becomes really critical and I still find myself that I I lack faith in a process because I've been around the block a long time and I've seen people <laughs> fail and relapse I've certainly failed at different things and, and I realized it's, it's very interesting when something seems to work. And you actually, you know, you, you do this and you resolve it and the guy says, it, it's a zero. You know, my father, and this is true, he picked berries at the beach 
And the father got very mad at him about picking the berries because he thought the owner would be pissed off. And when he got home, beat him with a two by four. He was five years old. And <clears throat> his acting out was another whole story. But um, he got it to a zero. And I, I was kind of like, you know, come on, are you kidding me? And, uh, but, he, but he did. That's po it's possible. So what we don't believe in ourselves, we, we have a difficult time in parting with others. So healing is, is an art form and a gift that far transcends anybody in this room. Much, much more than we could even begin to imagine. And that's an element that I have to keep in mind. Because as, as processes and training and learnings increase, egos inflate and our own stuff emerges. So that's something to be aware of. So desensitization by A.J. Popke. How are we doing on time? We have about 45 minutes. If there's anybody who yeah. wants, in about 15 minutes or so, wants to come up, somebody who's struggling hard to let go of M&Ms, whatever it is. <laughs> uh, and I'll, I can just kind of ad lib and we'll see, but I, I could try with the whole group. A, AJ stands in front of the whole group. He's, he's a fascinating guy. And I realized what he was doing last time. He sells these. <laughs> uh, he sells them. And uh, so I, I thought, of course, I'm going to buy one. This guy popped his name. But anyway, um, and so he's talking to the group and he's going like this. <laughs> and I'm going, yeah, yeah, okay. I'm not giving her the computer. Forget it. No, she's not getting the computer. Um, <laughs> So, so we, we are sort of unconsciously made available to the possibility of being different. And <clears throat> what, he, what he would you know, demonstrate very clearly is that this is not an EMDR you know, full-blown process to deal with those original triggers. And there's some distinct differences with the detour method. The protocol is for stuff happening now and what's triggering somebody now. In, in EMDR, it's almost like a sequence of little nodes. <coughs> and what the person can do, they can... How many of you have ever blamed uh, your partner for your situation in life? <laughs> I've done it twice. Um, as, and then how many of you have said, you know, she's not your mother? Come on, Charlie, she's not your old lady. Will you get over it? And, and he says, oh, oh. And the reenactment and the bringing along the baggage. So the idea with Francine is, and Shapiro is, is if you can take the most primitive node or trauma, maybe it was not being wanted by your mother. Or maybe it's the person I worked with who was a botched abortion. How would you like that? Now, how do you live with that? Or the 50-year-old guy who's sitting in the room and his mother's 80 and God bless her, she came in from the West Coast and she said, I never wanted you. <laughs> I mean, I love you tremendously, but I never wanted you. And your father was a shit. And, you know, and, and, and they had this beautiful two-day intensive and then he went home. That's healing. I, I believe some of this stuff works in spite of us with people present. And when you have that kind of opportunity, that's very different than... I'm not that significant, his mother is. Mm -hmm. And so when you can do this kind of stuff with the people present, it's even better. So <clears throat> it's, it's developed and refined and it's been tried and, and there is some actual research with it, it's applications to sex addiction. It mentions it in the back, pathological gambling and some other stuff that's come up. Also uh, with the EMDR stuff, there's some stuff on dealing with narcissists and narcissistic personality disorder. It's very interesting. In the Andrea Journal, and um, how are anybody members of Andrea? Yeah, uh, do you read the journal? Sometimes it doesn't get out of the plastic in my life. But if you do, it's, it's quite um, enlightening. It's good stuff, I think. So it says <clears throat> it's trauma-based com combining, and if you listen to these words, they're meaningful. Combining client internal resources <clears throat> with external support, including your 12-step model, proven treatment methods, and he goes through a whole rack and he says, the basis of our foundation is the adaptive information processing using the bilateral stimulation to uncover and process the base trauma or core issues as the underlying cause of the addiction. I believe that's good contemporary science. And I don't think there's a single soul that has ever come through the doors at Keystone 
who was insanity taken out of context. And I mean that. They're, every case, somehow or another, makes sense to me. That it's okay, no. That it's damaging, you know, illegal, whatever, yes. But that, that it happens, that there's a root understanding of it, I'm, it doesn't baffle me at all. So the difference between the detour, if, if you're familiar with the MDR, <clears throat> is that it's the present versus the past. And a lot of people, I have found over and over again, um, like what, what Ken does with the mother and men stuff, guys that do really good work, this sacred person they're not going to touch with a 10-foot pole is mother. One guy had, had dreams about her in her night robe, and you know he had, was getting erections and everything, but he wasn't going there. And he wasn't going to touch mom. So the past is important. And, and some of his stuff, obviously, is, is not going to get finished overnight. It might take years. It took him 40-some years to get into treatment. And what Shapiro says is people, people come into treatment because of symptoms. The symptoms aren't the problem. The symptoms are signs of the original issues that are unresolved in their lives. And I, I think that's important. So the sensations versus the affect and cognitions, because this is about feeling, and I'll show you in a few minutes what this is like. And I think this is really important when, when I deal with the sex addicts in, in the program. It access, accesses positive experience through positive body states, while EMDR positive experience through uh, affect and positive and negative cognitions. How does one feel when they presented the doors at the bottom of their sex addiction, what do they look like and what do they feel like? Sharon O'Hara's wonderful definition of the sex addict, and I don't know if she made it up, a piece of shit that thinks the world revolves around them. That's what they feel like. How many are suicidal? Large percentage. They, they may not have the wherewithal to do it, but I know of one who just recently did. Some other people in the room know who I'm talking about. After two residential stints, years of outpatient treatment, he uh, reenacted his stuff, got caught, and um, after the sentencing, he went home and uh, he killed himself with his life. You know, newspapers and all that. So it's, it's very powerful to understand that. He and it was, was incapable, in my opinion, of seeing any way out of or light at the end of the tunnel. The level of urge versus the subjective unit of discomfort. Um, this is important in addiction. Addicts understand this language, the level of urge, compulsion, urge. We know the classical <laughs> definition of addiction is an obsessive compulsive disorder. Thinking about an order amounts of time spent, thinking about you know processing, how am I gonna do it, etc. And then the physical compulsion to do it. How did I just do that? Not even why, how? How did I do that? I can't believe I did that. Early processing versus later processing allows work in early stage recovery. And his argument is that yes, you can treat alcoholics, addicts, sex addicts, gamblers with this desensitization of urge process. And no, they're not going to relapse because you did it. You may be thwarted by the emergence of traumas that aren't going to allow you to finish the detour process, but you're not, you're not going to hurt the person by helping them desensitize the urge. The question is whether they want to or not. That's, that's the critical piece. So <clears throat> this is the process. This, you only have two slides left. Um, you do the history. You should know the history. We, you know, again, I have like a luxury, I think, in, in what I do and where I work. You do your assessment and preparation. You explain in very simple layman's terms, what EMDR, they get, I like the floppy disk story, they get it. They all understand it completely. And it speaks to that compulsive nature as to how they are. The positive uh, begins with a resource state of empowerment. And what that is, is you want them to experience now a time then when they felt, try this with yourselves. How many of you remember a time in your life when you felt 100% in charge, in control, fulfilled at the top of your game, and in, good, in good space. So you, you breathe that in, 
right? Should I just do it on him without even asking him? Um, anyway, <laughs> so you get him to remember this state, right? So what, what, what Popky would do is he'd say, well, you know, do you want to fine tune it? Do you remember where you were? Do you remember where you were? Where were you? Skiing. You were skiing. That's cool. I never was too successful with that. So you're skiing. That takes a lot of control, a lot of freedom, and I guess courage in a way to let go, or insanity, one or the other. Um, and you remember that. Remember what it feels like in the skis and kind of, and, they, and then he says, like, do you want to blow the picture up a little bit? Can you see it even bigger now? Right? And then he would do this. He would do the, of course, he would use this. Um, I like the fingers. I don't know if my rotator cuff will burn out. But, and you just follow with the eyes, and you breathe deeply. And then I always ask him, where do you feel that? Now, where do you, where do you guess that Mike will feel this? Let's ask him. Where, where do you feel it? I feel like I'm, I didn't invite him to do this. In your chest. It's a, it's a good feeling, isn't it? Okay. So just like be in that moment for a minute, enjoy it, breathe into it. And then he stops and he says, now think of something sucky. Maybe the heat in the room, I don't know. Something. Yeah. So on a scale of one to ten, it's something like a two. It feels kind of sucky, right? Yeah. All right. Now go back to your image there of skiing and feeling at the top of your game there and being free and successful at that. How, how sucky is it now? I feel the coolness. Feel the coolness. All right. I'm not sure if we. <laughs> All right. That's nice. Uh, the the point is that somebody learns, and he, he would say very quickly, congratulations, you just learned how to change your emotions like that. How many in here are old enough to remember um, Charlie Chaplin's movie where the silent film where he goes like this? <laughs> you remember, uh, any of you seen those, those uh, YouTube clips uh, on smiling and how smiling releases Endorphins in the body. Do it, Tim. <laughs> Do it. Oh, come on, right, come on, come on, come on, smile. smile. <laughs> Any of you feel like crap right now, or hot, or tired, or anything else? You smile. It does, doesn't it? It changes your affect. And what is the affect of the average addict? It's pretty negative. It's pretty dark. And for the most part, she or he has some pretty strong physiological and medical and so on consequences from it. Not always, but oftentimes, in terms of lifestyle. <laughs> so the next part, I don't know, do we have anybody who wants to be a victim here? Ah, someone in the back. Do you want to come up? All right. Now don't fall off the chair. Right hand or left? So I think we're doing that. Huh? You might fall off. Um, Steve, will you catch? If, uh... I'll catch. All right. Thank you. I'll spot it. Now the. Did you turn that on? Or did it just go on. I turned it off. All right. All right. On your last page, AJ has a little choo-choo train, and he has the process here, and. Um, <clears throat> What you want to deal with, I guess most significantly sometimes, is, is think about what, what the issue is that the person wants to work with. So it can't be too serious. It's not. Okay. <clears throat> I've done my own EFDR work already. So, so you did that. Yeah. Okay. Have you ever done this before? The detour uh, stuff? No. Mm -hmm. No. So we'll see if I can remember it. And um, <laughs> tell me, Robin, a time in your life when you felt really successful and empowered and in control. You really just felt really good about it. What was happening? Oh, um, well, I gave a presentation in front of about 2,000 people. Wow, that's a huge number of people. I don't know. Yeah, it was five minutes and I did it without any notes. That it just like yeah, I practiced and practiced and practiced, and I uh, um, <coughs> decided to just throw my notes away at the last minute. That's a big deal. What? I don't think too many of us have ever actually presented to that number of people. That's pretty.
pretty neat. And do you, you kind of have a memory of that? Do you remember I that do. moment? Yeah. How, how was that for you? It was great. Yeah. And do you, do you have like a picture of it? Can you see yourself kind of doing that? Yes, I can. Yeah. And do you want to blow it up a little bit? Um, I do better with my eyes closed. With your eyes? No, you can't close your eyes. <laughs> you can do that if you want to. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So you have you have kind of have that image? Yeah. Yes. Tell me a little more about it. Um, I was nervous and I kept practicing and practicing and I knew I knew the information and I uh, and so <clears throat> excuse me so um, just before I went on the platform I was passing the garbage can and I thought hell throwing these notes away so you just threw them away yeah I'm also a very religious person so I felt I felt like I had done all the work that I needed to do and. God would take me to the so you just rest. trust God? I trust in God, yeah. Speak for him. That's, yeah. that's amazing. Mm -hmm. So where do, you, where do you feel that in your body now, if you think about it? Happy. You feel happy? Yeah. 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 Okay. It's good. It feels good, doesn't it? Yeah. So now I want you to think of something really a little bit sucky, as AJ says. Something that's not so great. Maybe it's when you get into traffic or something, an altercation or whatever. Mm -hmm. It's an unpleasant experience, but not too big, just something um, that I've had or yeah, that something. I continue for this Something week. recent it could be or whatever. So nothing that I'm working on or something yeah, that's... Like it could be, you know, like my shirt. It could be just something, you know, <laughs> something not too big a deal. Um, I have allergies to perfume and cologne, and I hate it when people keep sticking that stuff on them, and they don't care whether I'm choking. <laughs> that could be a big deal. But let's see. Help, help. All right. So I want you. It's fair enough. I'm sorry. Sorry. Yeah. So, so as you can imagine. Yeah, yeah. It could yeah. be annoying, especially if you're allergic to it. So think of your successful talk. Okay. In that moment. Okay. How how much does the Perfume and leave. It's still annoying. Come on. Do I miss you? Like ten? No. Well, look, I hope it's not near ten. Is it near ten? Because we we'll have to change. Well, it this fix. morning when I walked in here, the hotel was blowing smell into the lobby, and it was some kind of plug-in stuff, and I, yeah. I, I was leaving. But anyway, Tammy got it to turn down the. So you resolved it. So that resolved, yeah. So, so is it any less unpleasant? Yeah, yeah I'm happy about it now because at least the hotel's not doing it. Yeah. All right. So, is there anything else sucky that you can think about that so would be easier to get rid of? Do you think? <laughs> we have a resistant <laughs> client. <laughs> um, okay. Tall chairs. The tall chair. You feel safe on the tall chair? I do. Sure. Um, well. Something that annoys me, uh, maybe here because the chairs aren't that comfortable. Yeah. Is that something? Yeah, that could be carrying good. around. Yeah. Yeah. around the 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 chair. Chair. Yeah. So when you think about your moment of being successful, empowered, etc., how how much does that bother you? The chairs? Yeah. Not at all, because okay. I'm thinking about how happy I am. There you go. That's how it's supposed to work. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> that's well. That's we're just starting. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> now, <laughs> tell me. With, with, when you came up, you had some issue that you wanted yes. to work on, right? So, yes. what, in your own words, try to try to articulate as much as possible what would be um, your your goal. What would be your positive goal you want to get if you do this? I would like to. Uh, you want the issue now? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So, I would like to be able to come home at nine or ten o'clock at night after a long, hard working day and not feel that I have to eat something. <laughs> Okay, so so you would like to feel what? Well, I don't have to be hungry. I, I would like to feel like I don't have to reward myself with food at the end of the day. So so part of this is you want to get it framed in as positive a language as you can. It's not what you don't want to do, but what you do want to do. That's fine. Yeah, you know, you're doing a good yeah. job of it. Yeah. So is there is there a positive way to think about that? Um, I can be relaxed and feel nurtured without eating at 10 o'clock at night. Okay, or you don't need... Mostly it's garbage food, but I don't want to... Yeah, and popcorn and... So, so what would it get you? Excuse me? What would it get you to, to accomplish that goal? I would feel great. 
It's it's a I know it's, it's like a trigger. I just sit down on the couch. There's the TV, and I just don't want that to happen anymore. It's stupid. I don't know why it happens. I don't. <laughs> so you, so you like to be you like to be free from eating trigger. or triggers by yeah, food sitting and on the couch watching the TV. Yeah, so, so the most positive way you could put that. Think about it. Um. Uh, I'd like to be able to relax at night without feeling like I have to reward myself with food. Okay. All right, well, we, we could go with that. All right, so I want, I want you to just think about that. And uh, think about what that'll get you, yeah, to be able to be just free from any urges or free to just be, just to be relaxed, go to bed. So you have, you have a kind of clear idea about that? What, that? what that would be like? Yes. Okay, you have, a, you have, a, you have an image of that that you can make up? Yes. And do you want to fine tune it a little bit? You have like a, a, a particular place? And yes. Time of evening? And you're alone or you're with people? Or? My husband and we can. And your husband and your cats. And you're just free to relax. Have a cup of tea and no cup of tea. Yeah, let's leave it positive. Have a cup of tea. Okay. Have a cup of tea. All right. So just breathe in. And now I want you to do something uh, a little bit strange. And, and uh, how, would, how will you know when you have that? Would you say? How will you know when you have that positive state? I'll be just sitting there not wanting to get up and eat something. So you just be in a relaxed mood and, and sitting there. Let me know if nothing triggering me to get right. up. Okay. So I want you to think about that. And, and then I want you to step into that image that you have of having achieved your goal. Can you step into that? Mm -hmm. See yourself there? Yes. Pretty cool, huh? Yes. Relaxing, free from, mm -hmm. you know, enjoying your cup of tea. Mm -hmm. Sounds nice. Mm -hmm. And you have anything else you want to do to change the, you know, focus or anything sounds or? No. no it's good. The tea. Just the tea. Okay. So the next thing I, I could either do it or you can do it. But with can I touch your pinky? Yes. All right. Thank you. All right. So I'm going to put a little pressure on here, and I want you to go back and think about having achieved that goal. Breathe in, take a deep breath, and just imagine yourself in that state where you've accomplished your goal, having your cup of tea with husband and your cats. Life is good, relax, feel it. Okay. Got it? All right. The, I, the idea, if none of you have done this, is it's, it's sort of a physiological installation that the body remembers. It's, it's very interesting. So this is something that you'll you'll be able to go back to. And, and the idea is that it triggers the positive uh, state or goal that the person has. Does that make, make sense? Yes. Okay. So if I was there and I was vacillating and they touched my pinky, would that help me? That's the theory. That's the theory. Yeah. And I, I think it, I've seen it work and, and know that with certain people, it, it absolutely, if they do it. And they have to be really wanting to give up that. And that goal has to be, does everybody think that's a reasonable goal that um, Robin has? Seems realizable, near future, you can do it tonight. <laughs> I'll let you know tomorrow. You'll let me know tomorrow. So the next, the next thing you do is, is what, what prevents you from that and what triggers you. So when you go home, if, if like, I, I would think um, if I go home and I'm not going to eat ice cream or something, maybe, but my wife buys ice cream, it might trigger me to eat the ice cream. What, what triggers you <coughs> in your process when you get home? What, what, what do you think calls you to go eat or do what you do? No, I don't really know. I, I think it's something that goes way, way back, but I 
you know, if I was guessing as a therapist, of course, I'd say this is not. There's no rhyme or reason to it. I mean, you do it all the time. Every single night. <laughs> all right. So <laughs> let's just fake it. No, here. Um, sorry. No, no, no. Don't be sorry. <laughs> Do you, do you feel anything, like some people say hungry, lonely, tired, stressed, distressed, things like that. Is there, is there any kind of precondition that you can think of? Or? Yeah, I would guess, you know, um, I, of course I see clients all day in private practice and I, I could get home at 8 o'clock and hear a hundred stories that were, you know, like all of us and I do EMDR all day and, yeah. and you know, it's my guess is that it must be a way of self-medicating with some anxiety that I don't necessarily know I'm feeling, but I've got to be feeling after a day like that. So, that makes sense. That's all very reasonable, it sounds to me. So, um, any, anything else, that, like, if you think of that moment when you go there and engage in that behavior? Yes, now it's my turn to feel happy. <laughs> well, I think when I was a kid, too, I used to go, my other, of course, I don't want to get into my whole story, but right. I think I probably would sneak in my room with candy, and that would be a way of comforting myself. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, so it's just it's a comfort old behavior. Yeah. Yeah. So how, when you think about it now, and having that and that situation, what's what's the level of urge on a scale of one to ten of you right now wanting to go eat some of that stuff? Right now? Yeah, or thinking about it, like if you were if you were in it. I don't I don't right now, but I feel like as soon as I sit down on the couch, you know, there's a trigger. Like I feel like yeah. an addict. Like the couch and the TV and right. the cat. So that's your triggers. <laughs> that's the trigger. Okay, yeah. so go there now on a on a level. Say, that would be a nine. All right. So yeah. I, want you, I want you to think about that. You're, home on, you're on the couch, and I, the cat's there, and I, I had a hard day at work. You've been listening to all this crap all day long. <laughs> 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 I'm trying to EMD them right out of it. So just, just, uh, just think about it. So, how do you feel? Okay. Your body is running. Feel anywhere in your body? A little bit, yeah. You're stuck. Uneasy, a little uneasy. And what would you say the level of urge is to? Probably less. Maybe it's, I feel that it went down to seven. Down a little bit. Like that, just think about that. You feel a little bit in your stomach. Mm -hmm. Cats there, you're on the couch. I suppose the possible cool is there. I'm starting to feel uneasy. All right. Yeah. Where, where in your body do you feel uneasy? Yeah. Yes. So what's, what's the, the urge to eat or to act on? I don't feel like I want to eat. I feel like I want to cry. <clears throat> so the urge, the urge to eat is not there. Mm -hmm. So think about that. It sounds. It sounds to me like an ecstatic. Yeah. Feel sad about not all that reward. Mm -hmm. And your your positive kind of idea is that you'll be free from. Yes, I will be 
So that at least a little bit of what the expectation <coughs> is, what you have to look forward to really is a little bit when you get into that very dramatic desire. So what's happening? And when you said the word sad, it all went away. It just kind of freed it up. And everything felt good. You feel okay? Yeah, it kind of dissipated almost immediately with the word sad. Almost like I was thinking maybe that's why I was eating because I was sad. But would make sense for me. Yeah. How's your body? <clears throat> no, it's okay. I still feel a little residue, res residue of the, a little shakiness. Oh, it's not here, but I feel a little shaky. A little shaky. Yeah. That could just be the consequence of doing what you just did, which is kind of bargaining with. Giving up something that's been pretty comforting to you. Yes. Know, for a very long time. Yeah. And <clears throat> the next thing I want you to do is just, <coughs> just kind of, and we're, for the sake of time, we'll work on this a little quicker, but I, I want you to think now about a future time. And just play a movie of yourself being exposed to that situation and, and maybe temptation, however you think about it, or those urges, and, and see what happens to you as you work through that. And imagine yourself going home, you worked hard, and you have all those things around. And how do you do with that? Can you imagine just kind of in your own mind? Kind of play, a, play a movie if you want in your mind of going through that. Imagine what I'm going to do yeah. in a positive way or yeah, just yeah. yeah, see what happens. Yeah. Okay. Well, I definitely feel like I'm going to sit down and have my tea and be fine. You'd be okay. Yeah. And then the other is you got this little yeah. thing you can do, right? So if you want to also, you can think about another potential time you might have access to or be tired or lonely or hungry or sad or whatever. Sad, maybe. Yeah, sad. And you put a little pressure on that. And uh, how does that feel? I'm not sure, but I'm willing to try it. You're willing to try it? Yeah. So think about that. And then... Uh, See if that process can help you. So, is there pretty much no urge at this point, then? Or is there a little urge? Or... No, I think there's no urge. Okay, so you have this that you can. Well, hold on to it. Yeah, you can, you can hold on to that. <laughs> and uh, is there anything else that you want to say or that you experienced up here doing this? I kind of did a slipshod job of this quickly, but uh, is there anything? How was this well, experience Well, I, I thought what I learned about myself was that there was some sadness in there that maybe I need to address after I'm done with my day in a yeah. different way. I, I need to be aware of the fact that my job can be stressful and sad, and i got to think of something to do to kind of be brief rather than just being in... I kind of feel like the eating is automatic pilot. It's yeah. a self-medication. I'm not acknowledging my day, so maybe at the end of my day, I need to do something for myself that it's honors that. I have to honor. Yeah. So this this is kind of a physiological yes. little something, a tool that you can use if you remind the body of its entitlement to good things. And I, you know, I think in an addictive process, like you think about food, and I don't know how many of you have watched all of the different documentaries or have read much about what, what we've done to food. Um, the, the chairman of the board of General Mills talked about putting addictive substances into yeah. Lucky Charms. This is 40 years ago. Knowing, just like Joe Camel, that kids would be addicted to what it is. We have men who, when they go out to the store with staff, to get the pharmaceuticals or what they need, they come back with boxes of Lucky Charms. Yeah. Yeah. When did you that I always get confused about that. But um, what I and, and, and <laughs> sometimes Hopke says he just has the person do it, but sometimes he does it. I do it, and what he says to do is after after you do the um, 
positive goal, you do the positive state. And it, it sounds kind of weird, but it's not. You have them step into that goal. And that's when you do the installation, right? Yeah. Right. yeah. It's, it's after that. After that. Yeah. And you, you keep focused on the body. You pay attention to it and the breathing. And yeah, uh, back to breathing. Well, we all do. Yeah. 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 And how many in here have, have to think about breathing sometimes? <laughs> I, I recently had a client. He said, I can't, Mike. Like, he, he, he said, I, I'm constricted. He said, I, like, when I tried to do deep breathing with him, it was impossible. And, you know, what panic attacks are, right? And anxiety and shortness of breath. And so what trauma does is it constricts the whole system. And then an adaptive root, um, for me as a kid, it was sugar. It was absolutely, like, my mother was a, a, a chocolateaholic, and, and every cupboard had sugar in it. And, and we were always eating sugar, or our teeth were rotted. And uh, sugar is a drug. It's a mood altering substance, as is alcohol and as, as the other thing. So, so we have all the drugs we need in our refrigerator. When, when you stop and think about it, and they have a life of their own. And um, something I highly recommend to people is the American Society's Addiction Medicine Statement on Addiction, and what addictive processes uh, do to the white matter in the brain in terms of uh, morphing your discernment process, and particularly with food, um, cravings. I mean, think about that. Like, I'm 63, about to be 64, and I'll still go buy a chocolate bar when I'm stressed. It doesn't help. I'm much better at it, but like, why do I do that? You know, comfort foods, mac and cheese, soft pretzels, like, that, it's, it's all crap. <laughs> we eat crap, and um, it doesn't help us feel better, and yet we do it. And, and I think that's the beauty of some of these protocols and in the MDR stuff, like why, and this is classic stuff out of, of Christian uh, theology, if you will, and you know, the patron saint of Sex and Love Addicts Anonymous is St. Augustine, right? Everybody know that? It's the Augustine Fellowship, and Augustine, was probably the quintessential spokesperson for the divided self in Western literature. And William James quotes him and translates him from the Confessions in a really powerful way. And he's the guy that said, give me chastity, but not yet. <laughs> he said, why is it that I do the things I know I ought not to do, and the things that I know I ought to do, those I do not? Go away, go away, and, and maybe in a while I'll get it. So this process we all can relate to. And if we pay attention to the positive, at the end of the day, it's really not positive to eat ice cream or cookies and then go to bed with that. And yet it sounds good. haagen whatever. Ben and Jerry's. Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> uh, big haagen man myself. <laughs> But it's not good. And, and part of this is logic, and part of it's sort of a cognitive behavioral approach, but a lot of it is in our bodies. And, you know, they, we, we somehow, the 18th century, cut the neck off from the rest of the body somehow. We forgot that our body thinks, and that our hearts have neurotransmitters, and that that emotional life is the intelligence with which the species survived for millions of years, and we're dying because we've cut ourselves off from it. So this is a very, I think, powerful sort of modality that's safe. I was trained in one brain where you touch and muscle touch, and now we, we can't do that. I'd probably get, lose my license or something if I started touching you. Um, <laughs> that's right. We're afraid to measure their waste at the nursing station. Um, but, but something you can do, and what I learned in doing boundaries work with clergy in particular was, I used to say, Reverend or Father, you don't need to hug Mrs. McGillicuddy. She's fine. Her husband needs to hug her. <laughs> and what I found with this, and the, the eyes, one of the most powerful connections we have is with the eyes. And the fingers, and I, the Francine would swear by the fingers in the, this rather than tapping and lights. And, and there is, there's something powerful about touch. And there's energy. 
And if you're really a competent and caring, compassionate therapist, which seems to be the hallmark of criteria for being a good therapist, that people can trust you and put you or themselves in their hands, then that's really significant to respect and honor because we are bodies. We're not just minds, we're not techniques, we're human beings in connection to other human beings. And the energy that comes from that is, in my opinion, extremely profound. And so I, that's where I find this very powerful. Thank you very much, Rafa. <laughs> All right, questions. Uh, are you aware of the feeling state? How do you, do you like the feeling state? Do you like the feeling state? I like it because that's what I use. Okay. And yeah, and I'm, for some reason, that's, and I know what you mean by the feeling state, but that's the one that I, yeah, I do. Okay. Yeah, right. Just because I'm familiar with it. Okay. Yeah. Any other? Yeah. It was a little hard to gauge the speed. Is that essentially slow? Uh, no, for less? for this, it's supposed to be pretty fast for this. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay, so it's not like resourcing. No, it's and the resourcing and all, it might be slower, and when you're doing EMDR, it can change with people's dispositions yeah. and such. But this, it's supposed to be fast. Thanks. Um, thoughts on, if you have two therapists, one who's not trained in EMDR and the other who is, and they're both trained in EMDR and being able to go back and forth between the therapists, as long as the therapists are talking to each other and the person knows that this is what they're doing, or even if you were both present for it, I don't, I don't I mean, know. Yeah. Yeah. Do you do I do. And there's there's a whole literature on family therapy. In fact, Francine has a really lovely introduction to that when she talks about the original objects and downloading is all interpersonal. So I I see having in vivo the family. And then sometimes I've actually done the EMDR with the other person present, but you just have to make sure that you're careful. Mm -hmm. That, yeah, that, that they're not going to be negative or destructive Shame. in the outcome, that the, the people feel safe enough. Yeah. What's a good resource on that? The family piece? Um, the book is, it's on EMDR and family therapy specifically. It's loaded with really great stuff in it. And Shapiro has the introduction to it. Yeah. The, the uh, EMDR? The question is, is there any way you can support that? One of the resources you give people, you mean for the individual, in between, or, yeah, one is the butterfly. We used to get in school and we'd say, sister, look at me. Um, but there's the butterfly, there's tapping. Um, some people take a book or stand in a corner and shift their eyes back and forth. I just want to add, I'm sorry, I'm sure you're here, so I love this topic. Yeah. Um, this, whoever does this will know that this is also has a lot of side effects. So when somebody's leaving their office contained and feeling really good, they're going to they're gonna stay that way. And a lot of times, it, it continues through your brain, continues to process over time. Right. So as much as you feel like you have to give all these resources, which is you know. really good, Usually, usually sticks. All, almost 90% of the time, I've never had somebody come back worse. Right. That it sticks within the process, especially if you're really too. Did everybody hear that? That was that's very important. That, that whatever one sets in motion continues after the session. We're again, it's a process that continues to work. Yeah, and we forget that sometimes. Yeah. Okay. One last question, and then I'll let you go. I think that I do some of that, but I don't call it that. What is that? Yeah. Emotional focus therapy. I would say that, yes, absolutely. I don't call it that when I do it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you all very much for your attention.